And then on top of that, talking about what I'm looking at, I randomly stumbled across a friend of a friend's Instagram account and it kind of made me feel a lot better about my decisions to basically chill out on the going out, chill out on the getting on it and just become a little bit more grounded and grown up and stuff because I saw some people who, you know, I'm very close with and stuff before I used to go out with before, you know, having a good time out there in East London, essentially doing the same thing that they, we used to do back in the day and they're still doing it now. Don't get me wrong. They look like they were having a good time. They look like they were having a blast. And if anything, I was feeling a little bit jelly that I hadn't seen these guys in a very, very long time. And I would love to hang out with them again sometime, but I can't deny you know her you know thinking back to like carrying that same level of pace that I was on you know back then a few years ago in Dawson and Shoreditch and stuff it fills me with dread like being you know being that guy that was walking down you know brick lane with a bottle of flipping wine in my hand and stuff thinking that I look cool and trying to do that again nowadays you know because I've been out for like four days and I'm rolling still on this fucking Sunday afternoon I can't do that and I can't picture myself doing this I'm kind of happy that era's over but it was interesting to see that those people still exist and they're still doing the same thing and you know part of me doesn't blame them because I've spoken before about this before on this pod that you know it's really difficult to have hobbies as an adult i think it's something people don't really speak about enough often um but it is so if you do find something that legitimately allows you to meet new people fills up your time gets you out of the house even if it's destructive um i understand why you continue to do so i really understand why you continue to do so so i don't mind it in the slightest so i saw those guys doing what they're doing it kind of made me feel like you know what I'm kind of glad I don't do that, but also more power to you guys, more power. Um, but yeah, big up everybody in the chat here. Who else is Gluten Free Taco? Big up you, Gluten Free Taco. Big up Cheese Food here. Big up Super Jello as well here and everybody else tuning in live. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Um, but then on top of that, what also made me think about this whole thing, right, was this. I was randomly um, looking back and thinking, you know what? What can I do in terms of an approach? I'm trying to refresh myself in terms of approach you know, a kind of grown up, um, drug taking, drink, drink inducing, um, approach to kind of life apart from what I usually do, which is kind of abstain for a long time and then go crazy and then abstain and then go crazy, blah, 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 blah. But I'm just trying to think of it more as a methodology and a kind of a uh, way of life. And then I remembered, oh yeah, there was this legendary episode of How Long Gone with, um, the musician John Vanderslice. It legitimately might be the greatest of all time podcast appearance from somebody random who I'd never heard of being a good podcast guest. I know about John Vanessa as a musician and stuff. I followed a lot of his kind of um, projects and aliases over the years, but I never knew he gave such great interviews on a pod. Um, but he was awesome. He was so amazing in terms of like talking about his... Um, you know what how, <laughs> his relationship with drugs about buying drugs off the dark market about bitcoin and just his philosophy about being an artist was super refreshing and he had some really interesting takes that i want to kind of talk about here on the pod which i feel like were really really cool and kind of had a lot of kind of resonance in terms of how i want to try to approach stuff going forward so i'm going to try and get it loaded up on you on my side bear with me one second but essentially the first kind of clip I've got here is him talking about drugs and sort of creativity. And essentially he was saying that um, drugs should be, it's like a ceremonial thing and you shouldn't use drugs as like a way to kind of, you know, unlock your creativity. You should be actually trying to create as sober as you can, which is something you hear a lot from the people who are like at the upper echelons of what they do. But I think the guys coming up kind of have a different kind of perspective, but usually the upper echelon guys and girls are usually the ones that say a, a similar type of thing. Like you shouldn't be doing any drugs to kind of unlock your creativity. That's actually a myth. You should be as sober as possible to try and do that. But this is a clip taken from the what's it called how long gone podcast and i think it's podcast number 337 if you want to check it out yourself but this is a clip from there that i thought was really interesting where he speaks about this whole thing so let's play here john van der slice on drugs and creativity let's see if this plays i i'm in it this is my hot take i think it <laughs> decreases creativity i really do <laughs> i really do and the reason is i think that it's like when you're creative, it's almost like you're desperate for a little action. You know, you're desperate to get fucked. You're desperate to get like power. You're desperate to get money. You're desperate to get clout or love or out of your own fucking misery. And the thing is that when you start having fully realized experiences with like ceremonial drugs, 
it almost takes up so much oxygen and is so creative in itself that you come out exhausted. You come out fully satisfied. You come out as like a God and like those kind of people don't make art. You know what I mean? They just like <laughs> the weeks, the weeks after I do Aya, I'm just like in my house petting my cat and like sitting in my backyard. You know what I mean? I don't, I mean, I think of like the greatest records I ever made were in periods of like, abject fucking suicidal ideation and misery <laughs> like you know what i mean it wasn't it wasn't like a joyous you know place you know and like i have a really funny attitude towards like like art and the validity of 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 creative action like i really genuinely feel it's like the most sacred expression of being a human but i also feel that it's fake as shit mm -hmm. you know what i mean like <laughs> i i look at so much of what i've done in my life and it's like an extension of just ego stuff and it feels very dark and like contaminated mm. you know so and I'm, I'm not tortured by this stuff at all i mean i make records all the time i have a fun time i'm in general i'm very happy in my own life so i don't have like a complicated mm -hmm. uh thing to work out here but and he makes a lot of good points there but the one that really stuck out to me was the fact that he kind of equated taking drugs and you know trying to use it as a way to unlock your creativity he kind of described it as it's sucking up all the oxygen and it's a really good point because it reminds me a lot of something joey diaz used to say back in the day i think when he noticed when he was starting to go off the rails when he was starting to take stand-up comedy serious and obviously he was addicted to cocaine by that time but he was saying sometimes you try and go on stage high and what he realized was that it sort of like numbed the receptors that he would have or the senses to connect with the audience while she's doing stand-up and a lot of joey diaz's com comedy anyway is a lot of kind of like you know storytelling um and a lot of that stuff you have to kind of pull it from a real place and maybe just on the spot improvise some bits and pieces based on the time that you're telling the story but it requires you to basically tap into like a real emotion and unfortunately although drugs sometimes make you feel really emotional and they elevate your emotions, they actually don't allow you to tap into them. So if you're trying to create, it's actually the worst thing to do if you want to kind of create from an actual real place. But for whatever reason, society, culture, whatever it may be, maybe some, you know, some hero stories along the way has kind of led us to believe that, you know, doing drugs in that kind of way can tap into it. But actually, if you approach it from like a ceremonial point of view, as what he's basically saying, mostly relating to like the ayahuasca type of stuff to like use that as a thing to maybe um open up some receptors or make you maybe make you kind of you know reflect on your life a little bit fair enough that's like a life altering shift but once you're kind of once you're away from that experience and you're back to your regular life after going on a big trip it's back to kind of working completely sober and trying to do it that way in terms of clocking in clocking out like a job wise as opposed to tapping into those things all the time to kind of awaken some creativity thing that you think is gonna take you to the next level which usually doesn't happen like that personally 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 um but um another one that i thought was really interesting here was this clip that um he spoke about on the pod where he mentioned something about never doing never drinking or doing any drugs when, when he's on tour which i think is amazing as a punter and a fan of music and a fan of people in general and when to go see shows like it's, I want to see the best version of you. If the best version of you has happens to be part of your mystique is that you get on the stage and you're smashing, and you're all over the place, fair enough. But I'd rather have you be your best self than just try and enjoy yourself on the stage. You'd rather see someone someone on the stage, Stone Cold Sober, smashing it, and then at the end going crazy some drinks, fair enough. Um, and obviously in the DJ culture, which I'm kind of mostly speaking about in relation to this, it's somewhat part of the scene to kind of you know do a little bit of drugs and drink as you're kind of playing but in actuality like it doesn't really make any sense if you think about it especially in the kind of context of the space that you're in because for you'd imagine for the most part on most dance floors in any given weekend on any given weekend in any flipping club around the world you would say maybe over 50 percent of the people in there are probably high or drunk if that's the case i think as an artist or as a dj I would probably be best served if I stepped into that space being one of the sober ones, but also being able to know how to tap into that feeling 
that's kind of vibrating around the room and sort of taking those people on a journey because you're understanding that because they were, they're were kind of out of it, they just want to be guided. So actually me being the sober one that's actually guiding them through the night, that's actually a better way to kind of, you know, be able to destroy and to smash a DJ set to pieces and absolutely tear it apart than trying to go in there and be on the same level as them. Personally, you would imagine so. At most, maybe a little shot to kind of get you, you know, get you loose if you need be. But I think just being in a club anyway as a DJ, like w preparing to play after the next person, especially when it's their last tune and you're plugging in your USB and you're getting your headphones sorted, that adrenaline should be enough to kind of get you in the mood to kind of do it right. And if you're not in that mood to do it right with that, then maybe you're in the wrong profession. But I thought John Van der Sy's opinion on never doing drugs or drinking while on tour was incredible like but then he says at the end like you know he kind of will celebrate the end of a long tour with a nice drink and that's kind of the feeling that you can never kind of replicate that kind of you know delayed gratification thing is a real thing so let's hear john vanessai speak about this now everything after that is just icing on the cake. it's icing right? on the cake well what what uh so you're you're you run in elysian park which is dangerous so i'm, I'm praying for you <laughs> if you run on tour and it's in like a beautiful environment do you feel yourself being better or do you like the grunge? Okay, do you want to hear something terrible? I've never once run on tour in my entire life. Ever once. What? Yeah, never once. You're that you're that hungover, bro. You've been touring no, for 25 I've, years. What are you doing? I've actually never had a drink or done drugs ever on tour either. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Never. Okay, now that is the most fucked up thing you've said. So you're saying <laughs> you just have gr you just have group sex every night no, after the show. No. And no. there's no drugs. <laughs> I, I, I've actually never had sex with more than one person either. So like, I'm like oddly vanilla mixed in with like some crazy shit. Yes. Yes. Like, <laughs> Man. So you're telling, <laughs> so you've been touring, you've literally been touring for a very, I mean, you, you've been doing this for a very long yeah. time and, I, yeah. and you've done it yeah. at every level. I feel like you've probably yeah. done some really wild big shit. You've done tiny clubs yep. and you're saying you're, you, you do this stone cold sober. I've never, and I, I'm not being like just funny or just stretching the truth like i've never mm -hmm. even had a sip of alcohol on a day off even really and so i'm going to i'm going i'm touring europe in um uh in at the end of may so i leave here on the 20th and it's for a month mm -hmm. and it's i'm opening up for not a surf in europe i'm in their bus and it's like it's kind of it's a good i mean i've done a couple tours with them before but this is like it's nice. There's no UK, so you don't have to deal with like Brexit stuff. <laughs> There's, it's like Switzerland and Germany and France and Spain and like Belgium and the chill countries. Are it's there. it's the it's the it's a very high quality of life kind of tour. So mm -hmm. maybe two weeks before I leave, you know, so like any day now, I will stop doing any drug or alcohol because I'm getting ready for a tour. So I just go into like pure rehearsal mode, and I'll be like just focused on the tour and then the day you know the last night of that my girlfriend's going to be coming in to see the last show is in brussels and then that night we'll go out and like get some beers in belgium so, <laughs> like, so the, after all of that you just get some i mean i would i would have my chick fly in and i'm like all right this is where you inject the heroin into my eyeballs <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna go out for a schnitzel and a couple cold ones yeah what do you <laughs> So is, is so you're saying that you're just is it is it like a focus thing or is it just like you compartmentalize this stuff in your life? It, it's a fo it's a focus. That I I think that we have an ethical kind of agreement with the audience to be at our best every single night. And playing shows every night is incredibly mm. hard. Alcohol is notoriously brutal on your vocal cords. Mm. And like I also have a theory of like you do less drugs so you can do more drugs. You know, you have like these long Amen. swaths of, oh, not, <laughs> of not touching anything, you know, like you, you leave everything. I mean, think about when I was touring all the time, there were years, but I would, when I would drink alcohol maybe 20 or 30 times the entire year because of this schedule, mm -hmm. you know? And like, so it, it kind of like forces you into these like d very like disciplinary periods in your life, which you have to have because when you tour, all you see, you don't even see drug addicts. You see alcoholics. Yeah. That's all you see around you is alcoholics. You tour with them. They open up for you. You open up for them. <laughs> they work at all the venues. They work in all the venues, the bartenders. It's like, that's the, that, that's the kind of the payment for being on tours that you get to start drinking at like three o'clock in the day, every day, all, as much as you want. Yeah. 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 And then, and I guess just knowing what, 
a, a bar smells like at soundcheck at, yeah. at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's crazy. Yeah, that can be a sober. Crazy. Thing. So it sounds like you're just edging with alcohol and drugs. Yes. Kind of. Ex- yeah. Exactly. So I love that. That was flipping amazing to hear. But it also made me think about, can you imagine how difficult it must be to like be sober working as like a stage hand? Is that stage hand, right? Like a stage hand, like the person that responsible for like moving the equipment from venue to venue, who who sets up the equipment in particular music venues, or it's just a the general like handyman person. Like it must be really difficult to live somewhat sober if you're in that kind of scene. If you like jump, if you know, if you're the person responsible for like setting up rigs at festivals in like, you know, locations around the world or around the country or in your state or in your city, it must be really hard to like abstain from drinking or doing any drugs because, you know, you're, you're essentially on your feet like for like 10 hours plus a day. You're in the hot sun. You're surrounded by people that are absolutely smashed. So I can only imagine what that's like. It's probably a fun job. You get to meet a lot of interesting people. You work in the industry too. You probably have a job. I won't say somewhat for life, but you're an integral member of the industry of the music industry because you're essentially the you know the framework which everything kind of sits on. Um, you're setting stuff up and whatever it may be. I don't know what the term is called for it, but I'm going in my head. Somebody that does all the setup and you know the setting up and the setting down of whatever the stage hand that must be super super difficult. But I did like in general what John Vanessa had to say about just treating the occupation of an artist or as a DJ with respect, and I feel like nowadays especially with the economy being what it is. I know it's a, you know, it's a bit of a cliche now and everyone keeps saying it, but with the economy being the way it is and with people's finances being a bit stretched or their pockets, you know, not being as deep as it once were, I think if you're an artist, you kind of owe it to the fans who do come and see you, who do pay the £30, the $50 to come out and see you, who do get their parents to come and, you know, look after their kid to see you, who get someone to look after their flipping pets to see you, who, you know, drive down petrol, car park space, whatever it may be, buy merch. You do owe it to those people, usually working class people, to put on a bit of a good show. And you only can only put on a good show if you're in a good, good sound mind. And that is kind of just just abstaining from the booze and the beer and it's not even from the drugs and alcohol it's even for a long time we're just saying to you just do it 20 hours 24 hours before the show and during the show but then after the show's done get crap get fucking wasted if you want to but on the st- on stage i want to see the best of you possibly because most likely you made that music anyway that i love you know with sound mind why not perform it with sound mind i don't really understand the whole like getting on stage and slurring your words and being all smashed up like it doesn't really fill me with any confidence and usually i'm one of those type of fans where if you give me one good show it doesn't even mean to be that that amazing. Like, I'm not saying like fucking Beyonce level production, but just give me one decent good show and I'm a fan of yours for life. I'm going to sing your praises. I'm going to come to your shows anytime you're back in my town. That's how easy it is to hook me. And I think most people are like that as well. But for whatever reason, these people out here want to just, you know, they want their cake and eat it too. They want to perform and they want to get on it and it gets a little bit crazy. And then the last clip here taken from this interview that I love, like I said, this this is definitely the one of the greatest of all time podcast appearances that I've ever seen. John Vandersize on How Long Gone, episode number 337. This last clip is really funny because he speaks about not basically doing drugs every day because he has this, you know, philosophy on, on drug taking, which is basically um, do it a short period of time, then abstain for a long period of time to do it again, which makes sense because he's an artist who kind of produces at the highest level. He's got a big fan base. He tours all the time. He's been around for ages. So it makes sense that in order to operate at that level, he has to have more months in the year that he's sober than, than he's drug, drunk or high. That makes more sense, especially if you don't mind doing recreational drugs, but you also don't want it to kind of take over your entire year. So maybe you spec out like in a 12 month year, <clears throat> in 12 months of the year, you maybe spec out 10 months of when you're completely sober and two months when you're not and you just split up those two months you know across the year which kind of works out a little bit better which maybe is a grown-up way of doing it anyway this is john van der slice on it let me play the clip for you now 100 percent. and like so i think that when you when you like really keep it locked into that one ceremonial use even if it's completely like superficial like it doesn't have to be about transforming your you know like oh wait stop sucking let me hit this joint really quick it'll make it better (laughs) (laughs) something like that (laughs) i mean and then the other thing is that i think that like drug use is best and this is the do the do less drugs thing to do more is the idea that 
Like you don't normalize drug use. You don't do anything every day. In fact, I would say that like I wish somebody I wish I wish somebody would told me that before I met Oxycontin. But thanks for the tip. I would have kept you. I would have kept you safe. I really would have kept you safe. Mm -hmm. I would have been your better angel with drugs. John knows the difference between use and abuse. And also, pills are as you know, Chris. Like pills are easy. Mm. And and I also don't. I like the the, the rattiness <laughs> of a drug. Like for instance, I would have said you would have been better off smoking opium. You know, than and, doing and it's, it's funny you say that. I have smoked some opium in my time, and it's fantastic. Yeah, that's basically grass fed oxycodone, right, John? <laughs> it's it artisanal. Is, it is. It's a and it's a better high. It's more complicated. You know, there's more going on, and it's more functional. It's more full bodied. I can't toss eight of those back and wash it down with a smart water after a bowl of cereal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> what was the most like that you ever think you did in one day i was doing at the peak i was probably doing 10 10 oxys and and like five muscle relaxers at the same time (laughs) did it feel like kind of amazing though right (laughs) hell yeah it felt amazing bro until i od'd yeah it was sick (laughs) fuck and then what happened when you od'd well i thought i i I woke up in the hospital and i was fine and then i went home and i kept doing it for a couple more months and then i decided to stop doing it whoa yeah that's a good that's a lot of discipline yeah well i'm very disciplined now and i i believe that i was also very disciplined about taking it every single day and that was the problem i was too disciplined i was too disciplined about my intake the blessing and the curse of being a disciplined yeah, it person comes at you in different ways but i think that i think that your outlook is it's very nice to hear about because this is what I think a lot of people aspire to. I think Jason has a little bit of this in him as well. I don't want to, if it's that easy, to quote Tupac Shakur the late. Yeah, but for someone like me, I just don't have it in me. I have no, it's either, you know, pedal to the metal or nothing at all. And I think that's essentially everybody's problem. And I think that's where John Van der Slice actually smashed it. Because I think most people, myself included, have that issue of like, it's either on or it's either, it's either on all the way or off. There's no middle ground, but there should be a middle ground. There should be a way to kind of do it um, somewhat sensibly. Um, If that's something that you enjoy to do, of course, if you don't, then of course, just give it up. But I think most of us just recognize the potential to kind of do too much. So we'd rather just abstain completely because we know how how far it can go. You start off with a drink, like, because I know I, I've got some friends who, you know, as soon as they go out for a drink and they're with a group of people, that's when suddenly everyone gets around and be like, hey, who's got a number? Who's going to go pick up? Do you know what I mean? That's as soon as it starts. That's what it takes. Just a group of friends hanging around. It's past 9 p.m. straight away. Who's got a number? Who's going to pick up something? And then it kind of goes from there. So I can understand if you're that person to say, you know what? I'd rather just not drink. Because I know if I do have one drink with a group of friends, it's going to escalate to me doing drugs, it's going to escalate to me going to a club, to me going to an after hours, and then suddenly it's fucking Sunday at 4 p.m. and I haven't been home. So I can understand that. But I think there should be a middle ground. I think people should be growing up, especially nowadays, with stuff like the dark net around and Telegram and, you know, and drugs being legal in certain countries and whatnot, and, you know, maybe decriminalized in certain places. People should be grown up about doing it because it's something that isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, the drug taking, I think, I think intake increased probably tenfold during the flipping peak of the pandemic, especially when people were at home and had nothing to do. And it's probably going to get worse now with society being the way it is and people having to try to cope with flipping regular life. So finding a way to kind of balance and kind of make that make sense is probably the best way to kind of go about things. But again, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of personal inventory. It takes a lot of just effort to kind of make that work. It's better just to kind of indulge and kind of let yourself go. But um, I'm at the point now where, you know, I'm trying to my best to put my flipping hand on that gearbox and just flip and keep that flipping car in gear and not let it get too crisp. Because, you know, the easy thing to do would be to go and cop an automatic, slip it and drive and just go all the way. No, no, no. And if you're able to put that stuff in gear and just get it going but that's just my point of view on it you know i don't really know much when it comes to that sort of stuff let me see what you guys are saying here in the comments about it um and Tashki, big up Tashki. She says, I've never been into drugs. I've tried a few things because of peer pressure, but never was into it. I'm naturally ex- existential and sensitive to energy, so I don't need substance to get me there. Yep, for sure. I understand what you mean. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think recognizing what you're into 
or recognizing what kind of gets or jives with you straight away is the best thing to do. Trying to make it work is the worst thing. Like, you know, there's people that I know who essentially convince themselves to like wine. This is a weird example, but it's the only way I could kind of pour. Like that time when everyone was trying to drink wine and natural wines and be kind of, you know, all like, you know, um, cultured and shit. Some people just didn't like it, but tried to convince themselves to like it. And now they're at a point where they can't drink anything else but that. I'd hate to be that person. I'd rather just try something if I don't enjoy it. Just kind of leave, leave it alone. I don't need to kind of keep going back and around and around again just to kind of make it work. I feel that stuff is ultra, ultra, ultra weird and if you've got the option you know the peer pressure thing is hard but if you don't have the peer pressure thing and you can just kind of abstain off your own volition then why not why would you try and get involved in something that could legitimately be um you know that could get you down a really really bad path but again it takes time it takes effort it's not easy but i think you know with a little bit of um with a little bit of good intention things can go the right way if you need be 